We're in Afghanistan, driving through a marketplace. Do you see that car up ahead? Take a closer look. Right in front of it is a white armored Toyota Land Cruiser. And in front of it, even more cars with men with guns. Quite a lot of them, a real convoy. At one point, the guy in the balaclava notices that we're filming them and stares right into the camera. The other makes a hand gesture and just in case, adjusts the machine gun. The other vehicle is equipped formidably. Check it out, this guy has a soft armchair installed in the back to be comfy whilst operating his assault rifle. The guy next to him is holding an M16 rifle with what looks like an inventory number painted on it, 37. They're watching us closely without saying a word. At some point, they stopped our vehicle and approached our filming crew, all of them. It was quite a crowd. Some important looking guys wearing headscarves and their security and SAT helmets fitted with night vision mounts, sniper rifles in their hands. The man in the center of the crowd seems to be the leader. He has a formal dress and a scarf. What's going on? I am Kadi Bilal and I am with the security force. We are tasked by the Emirate government with providing security in all provinces and villages. This is the People Project, and in this issue, I will show you how people live in Afghanistan just a few months after the country was retaken by the Taliban, a movement considered a terrorist organization by many, if not all, nations. People tried to flee the country in the most unimaginable ways. They even attempted to ride on the plane on the outside in the hope that they might get out. Today I'll talk to an official working in the new government and he'll tell us why people can't get their pay for months and have to queue for many hours or even spend a night queuing for their turn to use an ATM, sometimes with all their family. To get some cash, you need to come to get a spot in the queue on one day and then come the next day and queue for five or six hours. We'll find out if it's true whether people in some areas of Afghanistan are forced to sell their organs to get some cash. I heard that some people have sold a kidney to pay for food for their families. How much does it pay? The starting price is about 2,000 US dollars and it can go up to four or 5,000. We also have a special guest in this issue of the People Project, a journalist and ex Alexandra Kowalskia, who will go on a reporting mission through the country shaken by the recent Taliban offensive. Judging by the look of it, this is either an abandoned military base or a police station. I'm pretty sure that two or three months ago, this was one of those many places where the government forces were fighting the bad guys with beers and Kalashnikovs. I saw the news reports about this place. There was a lot of fighting there between the government forces and the Taliban movement that is considered terrorists by many countries. The way people live in Bamiyan is beyond imagination. Some residences have been carved right in the mountain that looks like a huge anthill because of it. Many houses are made of the local clay and they completely blend in with the overall look. So from a distance, it's hard to say if there's any houses here or if it's just rock. People never failed to surprise me here. I was about to leave when a Talib came and asked me, be my guest to my house if you wish, I'm inviting you for dinner. Bamian's history goes back for millennia, and here you can see how people lived many centuries ago. And we'll also see how people live in Kabul, the capital city of Afghanistan. I'm in Kabul. I'm in Kabul. Maybe one day I will be able to say these words without wanting to scream with excitement and happiness. At the risk of sounding a bit mystical, I could say that Kabul is my place of power. I feel life here, like nowhere else. This is Lyadov, Kowalskia, and how the people live in Afghanistan. Are you subscribed to our channel? Not yet?
The sad thing is that Anton can't go on his next adventure until you do. So pretty please, subscribe now. That's right. Go ahead, click subscribe. Well done and thank you. We can continue now. Wherever I look, I see that Afghanistan will need years to rebuild itself and its economy. How they're going to do it is still an open question. The locals say that the Taliban-appointed new Minister of Finance, Gul Aga Sherzai, has no degree in finance or economy. I guess we can hope he gets some extra good expert advice then. You might have seen this footage of armoured vehicles carrying the Taliban fighters entering Kabul once they'd secured control over the country. So scene one, here they are, armed to the teeth riding the Humvees, and then scene two, here they are again, riding bright coloured bumper cars with cute animal faces and little stars for fun in the local park. Here is the footage of the Taliban parade that was broadcast on TV which features not only weapons and manpower, but also car bombs and bomb vests, also known as suicide bombs. And then again, here is some footage of the same guys enjoying a swing ride, as happy as kids. I loved to swing when I was little, by the way. Look at this again, taking a break from all the fun on the grass with their sniper rifles in their hands. The Taliban government has not been recognised by any other nation of the world, even though it now controls the entire country. It remains blacklisted as a terrorist organization by at least seven nations, including Russia, Turkey and Canada. The biggest problem that the ordinary people of Afghanistan are currently forced to deal with because of this change is cash shortage. The Taliban supporters say that it's due to the international community freezing Afghanistan's accounts, harboring billions of dollars, while those who are not so happy with the new regime believe it's because the Taliban are doing a bodged job of maintaining the country's economy leaving the people with no chance to make their own money. And it's the ordinary people who suffer the most. Many struggle to buy food and clothes. No one can afford heating bills in winter, not even the hotels. This is where I'm staying. It's a so-called guest house, and it's usually rented out to foreigners, mostly reporters, those who come on short-term visits. Everyone who saw the pictures of this place on my Instagram or elsewhere say, wow, it's a really nice place, great deal. Well, it is really nice indeed. But the sad truth is that this place is as cold as any other home in Kabul. There is no central heating in Afghanistan. People here mostly use the wood-burning stoves as space heaters like the one in the background. It's called Bukhari. The locals told me to burn some wood in it twice a day and that it should be enough to keep me warm. Well, it wasn't. I had to burn coal at least three or four times a day. The locals are more used to the cold because they grew up this way, knowing their homes are as cold inside in wintertime as they are outside. Cold is the reason why every Afghani home has a very interesting device to help people stay warm, which consists of a big blanket that's put over a table and can cover almost the entire room with an oven placed under that table. We call this kind of stove sandali. We use a thick cotton-filled blanket and we burn coal in the oven and place the blanket on top. This keeps the heat for up to 24 hours. The blanket is warm and you can keep your feet under it. Mm -hmm. About 80% of the country's population use this kind of heater in the cold season. Because there is no central heating? That's right. There's no central or any other kind of heating here. Nothing. The coal prices are through the roof. $29 for a bag. And the bag will only last for a week or two at the most. So heating is a big problem in this hotel. The guest house has no sandali because the landlord is stingy. The only way to get warm here is either to use a gas heater, but that's a huge risk, they blow up often, or an electric heater. Alexandra came to Afghanistan soon after it was taken over by the Taliban and spent many months here reporting about everything that was happening after the change of regime. All this time, she's been suffering from a terrible cold because she lives in a house with no heating. The owner of this wonderful guest house is now in America. He left in August when the Taliban came to power. Why? 
The answer is because he liked the Western culture and Western music a lot. He was wearing jeans and t-shirts as opposed to the traditional dress with long sleeves and he listened to rock music. His favorite band was Led Zeppelin and he was a huge fan of Jimmy Page. But that wasn't all. He owned a restaurant that was selling alcohol and that's Haram, strictly forbidden. Also, he had a reputation of being, I'm looking for a softer word, a ladies' man. He had new girlfriends every week. And with this kind of reputation and lifestyle, his prospects under the Taliban rule weren't looking good. So he decided to take no chances and fled the country. He's now managing this guest house remotely from the United States, trying to charge more for less, as usual. Alexandra talked to some doctors in Afghanistan who told her that the Taliban regime had started sending people with substance abuse problems to rehabs by force. You might wonder why I'm wrapping my scarf around my head. Well, it's because Afghanistan is a Muslim country, regardless of the fact that it was a republic until August the 15th, 2022, when it became an Islamic emirate. So either way, women must cover the head in public. Well, how do we define must? Unlike Iran, Afghanistan has no mention of mandatory headwear or any punishment for uncovered head in its constitution. In Iran, no headscarf can get you to a police station if you're out of luck. Four months into her mission in Afghanistan, Alexandra found her love and got married. Imagine that, such things really happen. She came to report on a political situation and fell in love with a fellow journalist. They did a lot of reporting together and having a man on the team helped a bit because it's hard to approach people here if you're a woman. Overall attitude to women in Afghanistan leaves a lot to be desired. Being a girl, bad enough, but giving birth to a girl is even worse for the locals. In 2011, the UN survey reported that every day up to 50 baby girls died in Afghanistan at birth. But life isn't fun even for those who live. Girls don't have any freedom doing anything with their lives. In Afghanistan, women aren't even allowed to leave the house unless accompanied by someone. In Afghanistan, you'll meet disapproval of the more conservative members of society, but that's about it. It's like they think that a decent woman has no reason to go out, period. So if you're a woman and you go out alone, people will look at you as if you had two heads or something. And they will also be thinking that these foreign girls, they are all indecent women and it's very questionable where you are going or why. Or rather, it's quite clear that whatever it is, it's very improper. Also, there's no way you can hide from people's judgment, even if you wear a burqa. It's like people in Afghanistan have X-ray vision, no less. They always, I repeat always, know that you're a foreigner, even if you wear a burqa. It's the way you walk, the shoes you wear, your hands, how you move, everything gives you away. Even the smell, and I'm not kidding. People in Afghanistan told me they can tell if a woman is old or young, married or single, or even if she's pretty. Telling a foreigner from a local girl is easy for them, and no burqa can stop them. Which is exactly the reason Alexandra decided that it'd probably be best if she goes someplace else besides Kabul. So her mission this time is to go to Bamiyan. There will be dozens of the Taliban-controlled security checkpoints on her way. They're everywhere here, in the cities and on the roads. It is to be expected that, as we leave Kabul, the bad guys with beards and Kalashnikovs will want to see our documents and check the trunk. But we have two women traveling in this car, and this usually works like a free pass. The traffic is heavy and disorganized. Some drivers don't even care to stop for the red light, as far as I can see. Driving in Kabul is not easy. People ignore the signs and the traffic is crazy. Right now it's okay, but when everyone from the government travels, they stop the traffic to clear way for their convoys. And until they're gone, everyone has to wait. Even cab drivers drive like nuts here, sometimes ignoring the crosswalks. <laughs> they don't slow down despite the speed limit. They don't even care for the traffic lights. They drive any way they want. What's the most popular car model in Afghanistan? Toyota Corolla. Many people have one. And it's not only the traffic that's disorganized in Kabul. Another serious problem is that the Taliban authorities seem to be unable to do anything about the massive amounts of car thefts. Sigatullah Rahim is taking a serious risk talking to us about this problem, and he wants to be heard. He's been working at the Ministry of Finance for many years. His post requires a skill set that is hard to replace, which is why the Taliban let him keep his job, despite the fact that they replaced pretty much everyone else in the ministry with their own people. 
Was your car parked somewhere in the street or in the garage? No, it was parked in my garage. So they stole it from the garage? Yes. And it had the GPS device installed. They managed to disable it somehow and stole my car. Oh, so you had a GPS tracking unit in your car and they disabled it. That's crazy. Wow. Wow. So I went to report it to those who oversee public order, but they didn't help me at all. They said there was no way to help me. And it happens all the time. Yesterday a car was stolen from my neighbour. It happens all the time. When I went to that office, the Taliban has for such problems. There were a lot of people there. 15 cars were stolen that week alone. But they didn't help anyone. They didn't find the thieves. Far be it from me to say anything that might imply the Taliban isn't that bad, I'd rather stay out of this, it's not my business. But my very first car, my Mazda 3, that was stolen from me over 10 years ago in my home city, hasn't been found to date. At the same time, it does seem that occasionally someone is trying to organise the traffic on Afghanistan's roads. For example, they install new traffic signs. Some of them are quite unusual, like this one here, for example. It does strike me as odd, with most people having a hard time getting food, that this guy on the sign is pretty chubby. How so, really? I can't help but wonder why. Public transport is available. Well, at least cabs are, although they are quite pricey. Well, whatever we paid for a ride before, we now have to pay double for the same ride. The prices have doubled. And that's because the gas prices have grown. Speaking of gas, before the trip, we had to fill the tank, naturally. That was the gas price, 84 cents per litre. It used to be a lot lower, but even now gas here is cheaper than in Russia even though, unlike Russia, Afghanistan has very little oil. It's true that nearby countries, including Iran, Iraq, Pakistan, have large oil production, and oil has been the reason for many wars in the region, but not in Afghanistan. So what is Afghanistan like as a country? It's a landlocked nation that doesn't produce much oil, but it does produce a lot of opium poppy sap that's converted into heroin. That's what Afghanistan has in abundance. To give you an idea, as of 2019, Afghanistan supplied 92% of the world's heroin. In other words, pretty much all the heroin on the planet. And heroin exports have been the country's main source of income. For example, according to the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, in 2014, opiate sales accounted for 60% of Afghanistan's GDP. And that's the way it has always been, despite anyone's efforts to solve this problem. While in the early 1970s, Afghanistan produced 300 tonnes of opiates per year, by the 1980s, when the war broke out and Soviet troops entered the country, the annual production was already up to 1,500 tonnes. After the US forces entered Afghanistan, the annual production grew up to 5,000 or 6,000 tonnes. You might have noticed that the only year when the opiate production plummeted was 2001. That's when the Taliban curbed the production, but the effect didn't last very long. So we are to hit the road, and our destination is Bamiyan province. 110 miles separate Kabul from the city of Bamiyan, and my guess is it will take us about three hours. It's a short trip, the kind you take to get out of the city on a weekend. However, with the Taliban patrols controlling the roads, one can never know how things will go. We're on our way out of the city. The streets are full of men mostly. Here's a little girl, and look, she's wearing a headscarf too. It's a market day, and someone here made an improvised counter propped up by a tree. Check out these neat piles of bananas, pomegranates and fruit on sale. Here's a guy surrounded by his merchandise, bags of onions. I totally love the sight. Check out this butcher shop with all the meat on display. Everyone is selling whatever they have to sell and it's all on display right along the streets.
I bet my bottom dollar that this sheep is going to join the meat display pretty soon today. It's how they work here. They slaughter a sheep or a cow in the morning, and the meat is sold out by the evening. Most people prefer to shop for meat before lunchtime. They say after lunch, it's not fresh anymore. That's understandable given that there is no cooling equipment here of any kind, and meat just hangs on hooks all day, even on hot days. Just look at this colorful display, how these men are sitting on the carpets. I swear, just the look of it makes me want to join them. Look at the nuts and the spices, the kids with big eyes. Everything and everyone here is so full of vibrant colors. I feel like I'm on some exotic movie set. Check out this meat shop. It's so bizarre. Can you guess what it is? Dried lamb legs. And the guy who's selling them is just under this dried leg canopy, like it's the most natural thing in the world. I bet you won't ever guess what this guy is selling. Take a closer look. It looks like a bunch of really big frozen dim sums or dumplings, but that's not what it is. It's dried milk. No kidding. That's how people sell milk here. They store it dry and put these balls in water whenever they need milk. Here's a tea shop. Just look at this. Dozens, maybe hundreds of teapots are arranged neatly on this traditional clay stove. And that's how they warm them up before serving tea in them. I say it looks awesome. This is what an authentic traditional kitchen in Afghanistan looks like. When I say authentic, it means that no foreigners are supposed to be in here, and most certainly no women. So I really feel quite out of place. The guys working here seem pretty much confused by my presence, and I can see that they are a bit nervous, or at the very least, uncomfortable. It's time now to buy ourselves something to drink. Here is coffee, powdered milk. This is a local drink. Here's three in one instant coffee, it's pretty popular. Wow, look at this, they've got energy drinks here. They are hugely popular in Afghanistan, and basically all soft drinks are. If you order a kebab at a restaurant here, they will most likely serve it with a cola or a Sprite. They think these drinks are cool, and if you visit any home in Afghanistan, they will most likely offer you some sweet soft drink too. Look, beer. It's alcohol-free, of course, because Afghanistan is a Muslim country. Alcohol consumption here is an offense, and you can get some prison time for it. When women go out, they wear a burqa that not only covers their faces, but their eyes too, with a veil. And here's what I found out for myself during my previous mission to Iraq. That the value of simply seeing a woman's face or catching her eye rises significantly when it becomes a rare thing. So in some perhaps weird way, this affair with showing one's face only to the inner circle works. But even so, I think they may have taken it too far in Afghanistan. You practically can't see any women's faces anywhere. And look what they do now with the advertisement posters featuring women's faces. When the Taliban took control of the country, people started editing women's faces out of the billboards or painting them over. So far, people say that no one has got into trouble on account of advertisement featuring women. But the locals' attitude is better safe than sorry. So they prefer to paint the faces over than risk it. If you remember, 20 years ago, the Taliban movement considered any images of people sinful. But today, the updated version of the Taliban is not so authentic. The docks. They've evolved as far as taking selfies. Nonetheless, the owners of beauty parlors and shops prefer to have the ladies' faces painted over. Well, what can I say? This place is empty. Many of the shops are closed. Those that are open are empty nonetheless. No one is shopping. The locals are struggling to buy food. They have no need for souvenirs. As for foreigners, I seem to be the only one here now. It's a very sad sight. The Taliban authorities have issued a whole bunch of rules for women. If you're female, you're not allowed to travel alone long distance. Seriously. They have an official document saying that no woman is allowed to travel farther than 106 miles unaccompanied by a male relative. I mean, how do they even determine which distance is safe or not? And if a woman, God forbid, doesn't have her head covered, she's not allowed to use cabs. It seems like we're stuck in a traffic jam. And here in Kabul, traffic jams are horrendous. We could be stuck for a couple of hours, but let's keep our fingers crossed and maybe we get lucky this time too. We're approaching a security checkpoint and chances are that the guys with Kalashnikovs will want to see our papers and search the vehicle. They make a signal to the driver to stop and he gets the papers ready. The checkpoint staffer takes the paper and prepares to study it. 
They put huge concrete slabs on the road to make a narrow corridor so that no vehicle could slip by unsearched. You can see the checkpoint staff. One guy's covering his head with a scarf for sun protection. They tell us to wait. The entire checkpoint took a few minutes. They talked to the driver, checked his driving license and passport. They asked him who we are, where we are from, and where and why we are going. No one asked if Alexandra is going to exceed the 106 mile limit on this trip. What a relief. But jokes aside, the Taliban have introduced a lot of rules limiting people's freedoms. They ban the use of personal computers and the internet as the source of all sins, probably. Playing chess is forbidden too. Playing chess is also outlawed in Saudi Arabia as a sinful practice because, I quote, it is a source of gambling and encourages animosity between the players. White footwear is also banned because the Taliban's flag is white. So wearing shoes of the same color is disrespectful. Television is banned, that's serious. Music's banned too. So if you own a hotel or a restaurant, you're not allowed to play music in the hall or in the dining room, but people say they do it all the same anyway. A lot of people used to wear clothes typical for the Western culture, like jeans or t-shirts. And today, people prefer to wear more traditional attire in order to stay under the radar. Is there anything else, maybe some movies that were banned or something like this? Could you elaborate or tell us more? The Taliban instructed the TV companies not to show films or shows that are produced in the West. So these are hard to come by nowadays. Some TV channels still broadcast some Turkish shows. Any shows that are not in line with Afghanistan's culture, as they put it, are banned. And you can't see these anywhere anymore. Visual arts are banned. In other words, people are not allowed to draw or paint. The Taliban movement believed that people should not draw things that replicate or seem similar to God's creations. Also, they now regulate how men should look. They must wear a beard of a certain length. Women are allowed pretty much nothing. They can't work, they can't get medical services from male doctors, and the Taliban is also pushing hard to ban education for women. The people are still fighting it as much as they can. These two school teachers asked for a ride. I asked them if they really walk to school every day because it's six miles away and they said, yes, we now have to. We used to share a cab back in the day, but the times are hard now. We don't get paid for months. So we walk. Imagine how they must love their work. Do you understand what that means? That means a teacher starts every day by walking six miles to school and then six miles back home after a full day of work. Can you imagine that? I bet these women are no Olympic marathon runners, so it must take them about three hours each way. So they work for six hours and walk for six hours. It's like they have a double shift every day. This is a school for girls for grades from 6th to 12th. With Afghanistan's two-tier system of secondary education, boys and girls studied together in grades 1st to 6th and then separately. Back in the day when the communists were in power, kids studied together until the 8th grade and only then separately. Right now, the Taliban government has suspended all studies for girls in grades above 6th, so girls cannot go to school after they turn 13. But in Bamiyan and three more provinces, some second-tier school girls are still open. Let's see what it's like inside here. Check that out, there's barbed wire over the entrance. The class is full because it's the only school available. Some students sit in winter jackets, because if you remember, there's no heating in Afghanistan. I am the principal of this school for girls. You probably know that after the Taliban takeover, many girls stopped going to school, so we have only one class here. We were forced to make a two-month break mid-semester. And you also probably know that the economy is very bad these days in the country for all of us. Our teachers haven't been paid what they are due for three months now. It seems like not everyone can afford the textbooks. But to be fair, not everyone seems all that eager to have them. Check out this girl. She's not really trying to read. And she's not alone in this. One of the girl's teachers agreed to talk to us, but requested to stay anonymous. 
We have a lot of problems and we are scared. Families don't let the girls go to school. They also try to stop teachers from working at schools. It's important for the international community not to recognize the Taliban authority because the Taliban movement treats women as if we were not even people. They say that girls and women must stay home, never go out, never study anything. Women are not allowed to be out after 4 or 5 p.m. They are forced to stay home, like in a prison, all day long. The Taliban Authority also introduced a ban for sports for women. Their argument is that when women participate in sports, their faces and bodies might become uncovered and attract attention. The Taliban regime insists that they do not abuse women's rights because they say that women are still allowed to go out. I quote, when necessary. A man next door has a young daughter, and recently some people came demanding for her to be married off against her will. So the family was forced to arrange a marriage for their 18-year-old daughter with someone they knew in order to save her from a forced marriage to a stranger. Or, when my daughter went to a market, she got shouted at because the Taliban said not to go out after 4 p.m. All of this worries us a lot. Unless the Taliban authority gives women all our rights and freedoms like before, we're asking the international community not to recognize their regime in Afghanistan. Many teachers are scared to continue working. People are struggling to make any money and feed their families. There is no agreement inside the Taliban movement. How can they expect others to accept them? Is the Taliban movement different compared to years ago? No, it isn't. They have always been savages, and they still are. In Kabul, I saw that women get beaten if they have their heads uncovered. Formerly, the Taliban authority has banned women from working anywhere, except as cleaners in public bathrooms. The word travels fast in the community about such things, but the truth is that this ban isn't observed as strictly as one would expect. In a local market, we saw a woman running her shop as if nothing ever happened. How many years have you been running this shop? Ten. Do you get problems with the Taliban? They didn't tell me anything. Anyway, the business is bad, no one buys anything. I rent this shop. Back in the day, tourists shop here from all over the country and from other countries. But ever since the Taliban took over Afghanistan, you are the first foreigner I see. Do you like your job? Of course I do. But the problem is that it's not bringing income. I have to pay the rent soon, and my transport expenses are 1,500 Afghani per month, and I didn't make enough to cover all this. I keep paying from my pocket. I spend days here trying to sell things, but no one buys, and it's cold. I heard that the Taliban forbid people to come here and work. They say it's okay to come and work as long as women cover their heads. Also, no male customers are allowed. If a woman sells to women, it's okay with them. So what can I do? Tell men to stay away? But to tell you the truth, men don't even want to stop by my shop, in order to stay out of trouble too. This lady's name is Nasim Nazari, and she's a very brave woman, I have to say. Are you married? Yes, but my husband is a drug addict. I provide for the family. I was doing okay until the Taliban took over. It's very hard now. Do you have children? Three. Two sons and a daughter. Hmm. Do they go to school? They do, but there are problems at school too. Yesterday my daughter didn't want to go because there had been a fight and now she's scared. She's asking, what are we going to do if a war starts? You think a war might break out? It does seem pretty quiet to me. It is quiet so far, but you know, last Thursday, two groups of men started a fight. Some got wounded, one man died, if I heard it right. So my daughter skipped school, and I stayed home too. If a war starts, we'll lose our car, so we won't be able to go anywhere. And what then? What changed since the Taliban came to power? The unemployment is through the roof. Food prices are growing. The economy is really bad for everyone. Before, we used to sell things and buy things. Now we can't buy anything. And we don't know what to do about it.
As we keep going, we notice a lot of new burial sites along the road. We're in Maidan Wardak, a province in central Afghanistan, and this is a roadside cemetery. It's a local tradition to put up flags like this when someone dies. It does look unusual. This place looks like some religious leader is buried here, probably killed in action not so long ago. If you remember, the nationwide ceasefire began on August the 15th. And until then, the situation in this country was pretty tense. All the fighting took a lot of lives. And if you check out the relevant statistics, you'll see that the Taliban suffered more loss of life than any other parties involved. It's important to bear in mind that many villages, towns and even cities surrendered to the Taliban without a fight. Like, for example, Afghanistan's fifth largest city, Jalalabad, some people there decided to surrender to save the people's lives, and others welcomed the Taliban in. It's probably time to say a few words about why the Taliban became a popular movement and rose to take power in the country. In 1979, the USSR deployed troops to Afghanistan in support of the Afghan communist government that came to power a year earlier and met fierce resistance from anti-communist guerrillas. Historically, Afghanistan has been home to many ethnic groups that do not form a single community. You can say that a few large cities have strong communities in Afghanistan, including those that support the new regime. However, the majority of the population lives in the rural areas, and these are most of the time quite poor, conservative people that stick to their traditions for their clans and Islam. Many of the guerrilla leaders who challenged the communist regime in Kabul originated from such areas. <laughs> So back when the new communist government started rolling out reforms that did not rub well with the old tradition, the rural areas met with them and met with resistance, self-organizing into multiple armed insurgency groups whose members called themselves Mujahideen. Every day people face risks here that should not be part of a peaceful life. The Mujahideen keep shelling and bombing the roads and threatening the lives of Soviet and Afghan road workers from the surrounding mountains. <laughs> That's how the Soviet-Afghan war started. The Soviet Union deployed its troops to Afghanistan and started military operations. But this only made the Mujahideen even more hell-bent on resistance. Thousands started to join the insurgency movement, including volunteers from abroad. The US President Jimmy Carter secretly approved the fund transfers and weapon shipments for the anti-government forces in Afghanistan, which allowed the guerrilla war to go on for nine years. In the end, the USSR withdrew from Afghanistan, and three years after that, the communist regime fell. Guys, sorry for interrupting. I want to share something personal with you. There's been already eight months, I think, as YouTube has disabled monetization for Russian YouTubers that we got from the Russian viewers. And since then, we're making the video with our own money, so trying to get new budgets. And if you like what I do, if you like our videos, I would really appreciate if you support us on Patreon, on PayPal or on Pioneer. All the links are in the description. I would really appreciate this and try to make even more great films for you. Thank you guys, now let's get back to video. I'm in a white swan paddle boat on the lake. It's a pity you can't see the swan now. Having an apple that I got, surprise, from the bad guys with Kalashnikovs. I guess it pays off knowing the local language. People definitely like it. The view here is fantastic. Lake water reflects the blue sky and the mountains, and some Talibs with beards are boarding bright-coloured swan boats. Truth be told, many of those who joined the Taliban are originally from underdeveloped rural communities and most likely didn't have much opportunity for fun like this. The locals who welcomed the Taliban when they took Kabul under control supported them mostly because they thought they were just like them, ordinary working people. If you recall, I mentioned the nine-year Soviet-Afghan war and that the USSR withdrew its troops from the country. But the fighting never stopped. The insurgents continued to fight the government forces. The fighting was especially fierce around Kandahar. The local population was suffering greatly from the civil war. In spring 1994, a number of locals decided it was time to do something about it and contacted this guy, Muhammad Omar. Long before he became the Emir, he was a Mujahideen general. 
in the guerrilla war against the Soviet invasion. And so in 1994, Omar formed the Taliban, along with religious students in Kandahar. The word Taliban is the plural for Talib, which means a student or a seeker. The Taliban managed to secure peace in Kandahar after many years of hostilities, which was the reason why many locals welcomed them. In a matter of a few years, the movement spread throughout most of Afghanistan and grew to administer roughly three quarters of the country, collecting taxes and getting its share from the opium sales. This is the reason why the opium production was curbed in 2001, but not for very long. The Taliban was heavily backed by Pakistan, whose interest in thwarting the emergence of Pashtun nationalism in Afghanistan was a matter of national security. In September 1996, the Taliban seized Kabul and proclaimed the first Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan which lasted until the US invasion prompted by the 9-11 terrorist attack on US soil. They are selling here all sorts of stuff for tourists, like hats and sunglasses, but I don't really see anyone in charge of this shop. Probably they don't get a lot of customers shopping for sun hats in November. Here is one man who's not giving up. He's selling all sorts of stuff, from bottled waters to ladies' hats and glasses. One thing that local street kids try to sell to tourists is called espand. Can you tell me what espand is? What is it for? Espand kills germs. How many years have you been selling it? About three years. The local kids tell the story that this herb has powerful healing properties. I don't recall its name now. And so they say it protects from bad luck, evil eye and all sorts of bad things. And usually younger kids sell it up to the age of 10 or so. Even though there have been almost no tourists visiting the country for the past six months, the restaurants and cafes are still open. And by the way, if you come with a lady, they'll give you an upgrade in terms of the seats that you get. They have so-called family lounges for family parties when men come with wives or brothers with sisters, basically whenever anyone comes with a lady. They all get a private space separated from the main space by a wall or a curtain. Right now, I am sitting in such a family lounge at a restaurant with our team's driver. Most of the restaurants are empty now. However, this is only because people simply have no money. Even if you get some money wired to your bank account, it's hard to get any cash. The Central Bank of Afghanistan has imposed a withdrawal limit of 400 US dollars per week, per person. But private banks only allow $200 withdrawals. People have to queue for many hours to get even that much. It's a very big problem here. Many people are struggling to pay for food. In Kabul, the situation is a little bit better than in the provinces. But overall, getting food is a big problem. Some businesses try to help people, and any place that offers free food, you will see huge lines of people. Some organizations try to help people with money. For example, there was an organization that donated some cash to be distributed amongst people in need. 7,000 Afghani per person. That's roughly 80 US dollars. And there were huge lines of people who wanted to get it. In some places, the situation got so bad that people started selling their organs for money. Look at this man's scar. It's huge. His name is Gulam Hazrat, and he was interviewed by the Associated Press. I just can't go and beg for money. I can't bring myself to beg for money. I can't bring myself to beg for money. So I went to a hospital and sold my kidney so I could buy food for my children, at least for some time. How much do you think Gulam got for his kidney? 
The starting price is about 2,000 US dollars. And it can go up to four or 5,000. It depends. It depends on the deal you make and who you contact, what hospital. It's illegal to do it, but people do do it these days. So between two and five thousand dollars per kidney? Yes. That's just terrible. What about the overall situation? There were some explosions recently, right? There were reports four or five days ago. What happened? Can you tell us? Sometimes we get explosions or skirmishes here. Here and there. But that doesn't make way into official news. Things like where the explosions occurred, who planted the bomb? Was it Daesh or some other group? They say nothing about that in the news. Before this regime came to power, TV channels were reporting news all the time. Now we get very little news on the TV, which is a shame. Sometimes we know there were explosions, even though there's no news about it on the TV. So how do you get news? Mostly from social networks. That's how we get news. Sigatullah Rahim thinks that one day he'll be fired from the ministry when the Taliban find a way to replace him with one of their own. But there's no way to know when this day may come, soon or maybe in a few years. These days it's really hard to know what goes on in Afghanistan because there's no free press in the country with any access to the political elites and the government in Kabul. You get some reports once in a while by reputable agencies, but that's all there is. And pretty often it's something really gruesome like the kidney story. At the same time, there's no way to know how widespread this practice is or what the country's healthcare system is like today. Remember those guys who were armed to the teeth who stopped Alexandra's cars at the beginning of my report? We pulled over and got out of the car and saw a big crowd of armed men, some of them in masks. As it turned out, it was a convoy for some important security official, and he got curious about us. He saw that we are foreigners, and he decided to ask what we are doing here. Oh, so you are a journalist? Would you like to interview me? Our job is to patrol the land and ask people if they have any problems, and to ensure security for all the people in our country. We are tasked with overseeing all of the officials of the Islamic Emirate to make sure that no one oppresses people or violates their rights. The people of Afghanistan have suffered too much for the past 20 years, and now they are very happy with our government. For the past few months, we've been working really hard to do our job very well. I don't really think he expects anyone to challenge his statements. They have more guns than people here. So he gave me an interview, or rather he just talked to the camera. We are open to cooperation with the people, and the people welcome it. We're doing our best to improve the situation. We ask the international community recognize our authority, our government, and that no one interfere with Afghanistan's internal affairs. Thank you. The armed forces of the Islamic Emirate are always ready to provide security for you. Our request is to please show everyone the truth about the Islamic Emirate and show it to the world. There is a lot of propaganda against us, but it is all untrue. The Islamic Emirate serves the people, our leaders, and all of us serve our people, and we are ready to help. I mean, just look at this guy. Do you think he's really open to discussion? How is one supposed to say how things really are? How can people even say they have no money, no heating, no electricity and so on? Mentioning problems with women's rights is probably not even on the table. After he made his statement, the entire gang wanted to take a selfie with me and saying no wasn't really an option. Finally, our crew arrived in Bamyan, on a mission that I announced at the beginning of this report. A 
And here I am in Bamiyan, the home of the famous Bamiyan Buddhas. The sun is going down, I don't see any people, just hear some chatter. They just finished calling for a prayer. And oh my god, I can't believe I'm finally here. The caves are right behind my back. I'm out of breath with excitement. Where Buddhist monks lived thousands of years ago or even more, back when this area was predominantly Buddhist. These caves and these rocks have seen so much history. I remember studying all this in my first year for my degree. Look at all these beautiful people. They also carry stuff on their heads, just like people in Africa. But they're different, I can feel it. There is some particularly majestic feel about living in the mountains. They also have a hotel for visitors. The Silk Road Hotel is actually pretty nice. It features traditional Afghan decor that includes even the smallest details, such as, for instance, a silk tassel on your room key. I think it's pretty. Every piece of furniture here reminds you that you're in a place with rich history and traditions. Everything in this hotel is nothing short of an art object. The place itself has quite a romantic story of its own. The landlady is originally from Japan. Long before she became the landlady here, she came to Afghanistan in the 1970s, fell in love with a local and married him. They are still together and Haromi even considers Afghanistan her second homeland. Seeing anything as old as these caves carved into the rock gives you an acute sense of how short a human life is compared to all the centuries these walls have been witness to. In the 13th century, this land was conquered by Genghis Khan, the founder of the Mongol Empire. Also, his descendants raided the territory of the present-day Afghanistan time and again. It's worth noting that Genghis Khan did a pretty thorough job of destroying whatever civilization he found here. Legend has it that on his orders, settlements were destroyed and the earth was salted to ensure nothing grows here again. Thinking of Afghanistan's history also makes one wonder when, if ever, its people will finally be free from all the suffering they've had to endure. So what's next for Afghanistan? It's a big question for absolutely everyone in the country and beyond. Some say that the Taliban will drive people into such poverty that they'll have no choice but to turn against them. Others believe the Taliban actually might bring the country to order and develop a working relationship with the international community. Either way, one thing is for sure. No matter how many times or who tries to destroy life here or salt Afghanistan's soil, they'll never succeed. This was Lyadov, Kowalskia and How People Live. Please subscribe to our channel. Thanks.